So today we are going to hear from our friends at Duke Health Performance Services. So if you read the email that went out before this event, you know that the folks who are going to talk to us today are going to essentially pull back the curtain on your experience when you check into a hospital and tell us what goes into creating the patient experience, right? So like in that conversation, even though these folks are our presenters, we've told them this already, so I'm not saying anything that I'm, it, this isn't behind their backs. They're experts, but they're not always the experts. You know, you have lived experiences that make you an expert too. Nobody, nobody can say that you're not an expert in your own experience. So if you have a question about something, if something doesn't jive with like what you have actually experienced, you are welcome to say that. And that's actually really helpful because the folks who are working on problems that impact our families and our communities, they need to hear like what it actually feels like when we go into those spaces. We're going to let our guests um, introduce themselves. They will give us a presentation. We'll do some cool things with them. And then you will go off into your cohorts. And I am going to turn it over to Kelly, I believe. Let's get this thing started. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amber. I really appreciate that intro. We're so excited to see you all and be here today and tell you a little bit about what we do and answer all of your questions. Um, and as Amber said, you all are experts in your own experiences, and we pretty much are trying to improve the experience that happens in a hospital. So we're going to go all through that today, but please jump in the chat or um, get off mute if you have any questions at all. So we are performance services from Duke Health. Fletcher is going to be our um, screen presenter. So Fletcher, you can go mm -hmm. to the next slide, please. Right. <laughs> Thank right. you. That's great. There it is. Awesome. So we're just going to do some quick intros, a little bit about me. This is a picture of me hiking. Um, I love to hike. That was my favorite quarantine activity. Um, I have a degree in industrial engineering from Penn State. So that's up in Pennsylvania, about eight hours from here. Um, right now, I'm going back to school, actually, and I'm getting my master's in health administration from UNC. Um, right now, I'm working in performance services at Duke Health, and I've been there for two, about two years, um, and I support the digital strategy office, and I'll go into more details about that a little bit later. All right, Fletcher, take it away. <laughs> yeah, so hey, I'm Fletcher. I'm super excited to be here this morning. Um, I think we all, I think everyone on the call that from our team studied industrial engineering in, in college, and that's a, a lot of what our department um, recruits. And so that's what I studied in college. And I've, I've been with Duke for a little over a year. Um, one thing I love about working with Duke is that my wife is a nurse. And uh, so she works for Duke as well. And so it's fun that some of the work that, that I get to do um, overlaps with a lot of her work. And uh, so I really appreciated that. And, and I, I'm on the quality analytics and reputation team, which we'll go more into those type of conversations towards the end. Um, and something about me is I, I love to play golf and that was a great quarantine activity. And um, so maybe if it doesn't rain this afternoon, hopefully I can get out there and, and play a little more today. So. Hey everyone, my name is John Hurt. I got my degree uh, from the North Carolina a and uh, Hopefully there's some future Aggies in the house today. Uh, and I study industrial system engineering. I've been with Duke for a little under two years. Um, I joined actually pre-pandemic uh, and I was a little background. I, I took a different path than some people here. Um, I studied, I, I went into manufacturing engineering and after that um, I wanted to change up and go to a different industry and we'll talk a little bit more about that as far as industrial engineers, how many different industries we can work in. Um, but for the last two years I've been helping support the both oncology which is basic cancer and heart teams and my favorite quarantine activity, um, <laughs> ashamed to say it's been gaming. Um, it hasn't been hiking and anything, but um, especially hopping on the sticks with my, my friends, uh, having some kind of social activity uh, has been the best thing for me. Hi everyone, um, I'm Salam. I also graduated um, 
from industrial engineering, but I actually went to NC State, which is right down the road. Um, so I was born and raised in Raleigh, so I love it here. And um, I've been working at Deep Performance Services for about a year, but I actually interned um, the summer between my junior and my senior year of college. So I guess it's been two years, but as a full-time employee, I've been here since the summer. Um, and I work to support the CMO's office and palliative care, which I'm excited to tell you guys a little bit more about later on. Um, and I'd say my favorite quarantine activity has been bike riding and jump roping, but this was like peak COVID, so I haven't really been doing it super often. <laughs> I need to get back, uh, get back to it, but I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Salam. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so just to get the juices flowing first, what words come to mind when you hear the word healthcare? Does anybody want to come off mute, write in the chat, anything at all? Nursing, medicine, doctors, money, teamwork. That's great. That's great. Really, healthcare is anything to do with medical care, physical, mental, emotional well being, and improving the quality of life. So, all of these things are correct answers. And um, we're going to talk about different ways to, that we try and help improve healthcare at Duke and also across our whole Durham and Raleigh and Triangle. Um, Different, different communities. Okay, so yeah, like Amber said, you all bring a really great perspective um, as you all have your own experiences with healthcare and your families have their own experiences. And so I just wanna sort of get you in that mindset of, um, would love to, to hear some answers, either come off mute or put some, some more answers in the chat, but like what are maybe some issues that you've run into in healthcare or some ideas of how you think like things could be better? They're too expensive. Yeah, cost, accessibility, how people speak to others, cost. Yeah, money. So money's a big one. Yeah. Making water free, biases, ED overuse, emergency department. Yeah. Some good oh, wait times in there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you all for these answers. Yeah. So many. I mean, there's, we can always make improvements to health systems. So um, we can always get better. And these, a lot of these are our ideas that we're, we're actively, you know, working on. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about industrial engineering in general. Uh, so industrial and systems engineering is concerned with the design, improvement, and installation of systems of people, materials, information, equipment, and energy. So I know that sounds like a lot, but that's because it kind of is. So industrial engineers can really work in a bunch of different um, sects of the world. Uh, and as industrial engineers, uh, we do our best to design how things are done to increase quality, safety, and productivity. Um, so as industrial engineers at Duke, we really, um, we really work to solve some of these problems and challenges in healthcare specifically. So this can be anything from improving patient experience uh, to calculating staffing for a specific unit um, and or to getting rid of waste in the system. So I did see a couple of messages in the chat around staffing. So I'd love to hear um, some more of your ideas about what you guys think an industrial engineer might solve um, at a hospital specifically. So feel free to come up me or put it in the chat as well. Um, whatever works for you. Excuse me, Salam, was your question specifically what we think engineers can do about not enough staff? Um, yes, or about any other problem that they think an industrial engineer might solve um, at, the, at the hospital. But staffing is definitely a big one, especially during COVID. All right, awesome. Um, I love those answers. And we're actually gonna watch a quick video um, to better explain what industrial engineering is. So Fletcher, if you wanna click the video link. Engineers are in high demand. To decide which opportunities to seize, ask yourself, would I rather A, develop the robot, or B, design the robotic warehouse? A, develop the heat shield, or B, coordinate the space mission? A, analyze the airfoil, or B, design the airport? A, develop the packaging, or B, create the supply chain? If you answered B to any of these questions, industrial and systems engineering could be for you. We design and operate large complex systems and processes that combine many of the products that other engineers develop. These systems and processes provide us with reliable sources of food and water, deliver energy where and when it's needed, create value in the marketplace, drive our economy, 
and make global society possible. We don't worry about one robot, we develop systems that coordinate hundreds. We are systems thinkers. We focus on the decision sciences. How do we get products to the customer faster and cheaper? How do we get passengers to their destination safely and on time? Industrial and systems engineers focus on the data sciences. What data do we need for effective decision making? Where do we get it? How do we turn it into actionable information that helps us make tough decisions? We consider the problems of uncertainty. How can we make good decisions in the present when the future is unknown? What if we have wildfires, storms, or earthquakes? How can we most effectively recover? If any of these aspects appeal to you, if you are good at math, open-minded, and like to think more broadly, if you have a broad range of interests, enjoy working with data, care about people, and want a career with flexibility, then industrial and systems engineering will be a good fit for you. We are in every industry, we're in every company, and we move up the management ranks very quickly. Career opportunities are plentiful and growing, so consider industrial and systems engineering as your major. The skills you will learn will take you around the world and beyond. For more information, visit us online. So um, as you all saw in the video, industrial and systems engineers can make things better in any industry. So this can be anything from automobile manufacturing and aerospace to healthcare, um, to forestry, forestry, finance, leisure, and education. Um, so I actually worked in manufacturing for a quick a summer, um, similar to John, uh, but I really found my passion in healthcare. So, um, but I have friends who study industrial engineering at, at NC State who work in all these different industries, which is which is really great to see. Okay, so as industrial engineers, one of the main things we do is around process improvement. Um, that's the reason why that we can be in so many different industries is because every industry or any job or any business has processes that are inefficient that we can come in to help and improve. And when we think about process improvement, there's five things we sort of like in on and it's around time saving, uh, so making the process uh, as efficient and as, as fast as possible, uh, cost savings, uh, having it to be not an expensive process, um, customer experience, making sure that either if it's manufacturing and you're building a car for, uh, for a person that the customer is happy with it, or in healthcare that the patient's happy with their service. Um, and then most importantly, we have uh, quality and safety at the the crust of everything, it's making sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing it uh, in a safe manner and then also helping build a better work environment. So I'm gonna let you into a little secret uh, right now. Um, it's almost impossible to do all these five things at the same time. And this is sort of what we're seeing in the hospital. Uh, I saw it in the chat as far as uh, waiting times is, is an issue, but also customer experience and then creating a better work environment where understaffed. And so it's this constant sort of matrix thing that we're dealing with. And I'm doing a lot of work uh, with oncology treatment centers. And uh, as far as the ones at Duke, the understaffed right now, uh, which is creating not a great work experience. And that's also in terms of not making the customer happy because they have longer wait times to get treated. And it's, we're also trying to cut back on costs as, as well. And it's, it's a, a constant matrix that is either like two things can happen at one time. Either you're gonna have a lot of people come in one day, which is gonna be help out with costs, but then there's gonna be longer wait times and then better work experience and then uh, a, a worse work experience. Or you can have more nurses, better costs, well, I mean, a better experience, but like be less on costs. So it's always this thing that we're working with the teams to figure out what's the right formula um, for the job. Okay, I think we're gonna go in and transition now to our uh, to groups. I'm gonna explain our little project that we put together for the team. We're gonna give everyone now a chance to be their own health system engineer. Uh, we're gonna have a chance for you to build out your own uh, emergency department. I, I believe everyone probably has been to emergency department maybe once or twice in their life. They, you broke a bone playing the sport or it was something dumb or just uh, you had a family member that had to go to the ED. 
Um, so if you go ahead to the next slide, Fletcher. Okay, uh, so we're gonna separate into groups and uh, essentially we'll have, uh, everyone's gonna, we'll be paired up with uh, one of us four and we're gonna guide you through uh, building your own ED. Uh, so essentially uh, you're gonna be able to go ahead and name your ED. You're gonna set up the process and the flow that you think is best uh, for your hospital. Um, so work in like, uh, give you a little layout, uh, we have a check-in desk. We have a triage room. Does anyone want to put in the chat or want to come off mute to know what a triage means? Well, triage is basically just another way of the saying like emergency, emergency. So uh, basically, we have triage nurses that's working uh, within uh, uh, the emergency department and. They uh, work on, help out with anything as far as if it's a broken bone, if it's a heart attack or anything like that. Um, so it's just another way of saying the emergency. Um, then you have your waiting areas, your exam rooms and your nursing station where you might get your measurements as far as your weight, your height, uh, your blood pressure. So we're gonna go ahead and separate the groups and you can go ahead and decide as well, what's best with the team as far as um, what is the best way to set up your hospital. And then also, uh, but just try to keep it in, uh, in mind of the five things around process improvement. So cost, time, uh, safety, and customer experience and creating a better work environment for everyone. Waiting area, like to the bottom left of the door. Okay. We have the... No, no, no. I mean the exam to the bottom left of the door, and then oh. have the nursing station like in the bottom right corner, where only like really it's the only nurse you should go there. Uh huh. Like, room like yeah. Imagine, but if it's an emergency, wouldn't that be? But if it's an emergency, wouldn't it be too far? No, the, no. The exam room is where you go. That, yeah. So I yeah, think, but if it's a nurse station. So I think nobody like let's say for this purpose no patients will need to go to the nurse's station, but that's where the nurses will need to, like some nurses may be there if they need to like respond to somebody that comes in or that's where, um, that's where they'll be hanging out. And we can also make more than one of something. We're pretty much our only constraint here is the space that we have. So tell me this, do you guys think that for an emergency room that let's say there's six seats here, do y'all think that's enough? No, I wouldn't think it's enough. Okay. Depending, so depending on how many people, the many depending on how many people go to the doctor's office in one day, yeah. if it's more than people coming into the doctor's office each day through the week, you might as well have like two seating seating arrangements because mm -hmm. if it's less than six people, you'll at least have more less seats than if it's more than six people. Okay, so let's let's do another one. Let's double that at least. Maybe we can we can make them a little bigger too. Um, and let's say that's now like twelve seats, and this is twelve seats. Where should I put this one? I mean, there's twelve seats on both sides. Yeah, so like this would be a total of twenty four seats. Okay, so twelve seats on each side. No, six seats on each side, but it'll be 12 when they get mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, probably, like, since it's, I don't put that right beside the nurse's station. I think mm -hmm. I would move the nurse's station into the top right corner okay. so you can have enough for the waiting uh, waiting area. And then mm -hmm. the waiting area could take that that uh, two slots so you can have a, at least enough space to move Ooh. so it doesn't be all crowded. Yeah. Okay, good. Because if people have to enter in, I don't think people want to run into some chairs. Yeah, true. And I keep grabbing the wrong thing. I'm trying to move this waiting area and it won't move. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And then maybe, I mean, do you guys think it would be good to have another exam room? Maybe we could, 
Would you all think if like, it's if it's I mean how many how many people can be in one exam? I mean if how many people could be in one exam room? Yeah, if one person can be in there. I think you probably have two. Yeah. Let's say because this is kind of big for the space. Let's let's say this is like four patients, um, and then another room would be four patients. So here's a question: Are we operating as though COVID exists? And if so, mm. how does that change things? Mm, good point. It would change a lot if 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 it was COVID, then it would change a lot. Meaning only two people would be in there. Four people are in an exam room. Mm -hmm. So two people have to be in there instead of four. So you would have to have another exam room. Do we yeah. have multiple floors in this hospital to make sure that uh, that like in case it is COVID, we have multiple exam rooms on the second floor and then all that on the first floor? Mm, that's a good point. I think that could be your recommendation to the boss. Like, hey, um, I think we should use the floor upstairs too and, and make this like maybe have the same floor plan on the top and bottom so that it's spaced out. Because I think it well, would be no, good I'm to... Not, I'm not necessarily I mean, saying like, have that's the same, way. Floor, same I mean, floor plan on the top and bottom. I'm saying have this floor plan on the bottom and they just have a whole lot of exam rooms on the, on the second floor. Mm, mm, mm. Since, like COVID, since COVID, most people can't really get into an exam room if the first floor is filled then you'll have to go to the second floor okay i'm gonna see if i can i can make this happen let's just say it's gonna be a little smaller but let's say this is our upstairs up here all right is our upstairs just fill it with the teams okay all our exam rooms Every, I like that. not everywhere i wouldn't put it everywhere i'll probably put like two beside each other and then probably like two at the bottom of the bottom like and then there will be like an uh check-in i mean a check-in desk well, probably in like check-in desk on the second floor because you already have the check-in desk on the first but, floor if most people couldn't get to the first floor and the first floor is filled well, the, first, with people the, first floor, the first floor is what you go through to go to the second floor is what i was presuming and then uh -huh. the check-in desk. That makes that, yeah, that makes more sense. You go up to the second floor, which is full of exam rooms, and you have like an exam room on the bottom, or maybe you have only exam rooms on the top floor, and then you have another waiting area on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense. And probably put like one waiting area. Yes, yeah, so exam room built upstairs. I like put an extra. I actually put an extra waiting room right next to the right right there next to next to both the all three of the waiting rooms and then have six exam rooms so i think that will fit six exam rooms okay and two more up here where would people, but where would people wait if the exam rooms are filled well they would wait. they would wait in the waiting area yeah i guess so yeah like maybe you could still wait downstairs and then like once you're actually being seen then you could go upstairs well, upstairs yeah that's that's, that's all i idea. got great idea oh and what about says, Daniel says, uh, Daniel, just throw a wrench in it. <laughs> yeah, that's a point. That's a great thing to think about. Um, so maybe we need to put one of these upstairs too. So what do you guys think? Should I get rid of one of these exam rooms? Yeah. You would have to get rid of both. You would have to get rid of both. Yeah, you would. Okay. You would have to get rid of both because it's a safe spot. I mean, you would have to have them so they can help you. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, also, we have 20 seconds left. Um, you could probably put another exam room downstairs, stairs. right be right beside the uh, get triage the room, uh, uh, nurse station, if you move over the tree. Uh, I can't say that word, triage room. So, put this where? Here, over here? Yeah, probably put the other. Uh, no. yeah. And Salam, let me ask you something. Um, did you, like, what got you into engineering? Were you, like... The kid, we were having this conversation uh, when we first met your team. Like, were you the kid who straightens up the spoons in the drawer? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or says, hey, if I move the mugs this way, I could fit more into the cabinet. Kind of. I honestly, I was telling the group earlier that I really didn't know what industrial engineering was until mm -hmm. I actually got to college because I feel like it's it's really, like, super specific, and I, I had never heard of it, and I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, so I kind of just applied to college and was hoping for the best and to find something that I was really interested in, um, and I really, really love healthcare, but not enough 
to be a doctor <laughs> or to be anything clinical. And so um, I was actually walking through one of the buildings at school and I saw um, a poster with like health systems engineering. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds so cool. It's exactly what I wanted to do. Wow. Um, and so I just kind of went from there and applied to be an industrial engineer. And I got in and just kind of took it like one step at a time. So I just kept making like the next best decision. And thankfully I landed here. So That's there right. was that. That's great, Salam, because I think there's a myth. I know there was for me as a kid. I wasn't always the best in school. And I got this feeling like the kid next to me knew what they wanted to be at seven. Or like, you know what I mean? They like popped out a mom and said, I want to be a physician. And like, whoa, I, I'm still trying to figure it out, you know? Um, so it's great that uh, you kind of had that faith in yourself to be able to say, okay, I'm going to get to the university and I'll figure it out. Yeah, exactly. I um I actually wanted to be a judge when I was growing up, but thank goodness I did not go down the route because I don't even like really read for pleasure or anything like that. So I just don't think, you know, oh, that legalese. Huh? <laughs> That's so funny because I also thought I wanted to be a judge. And actually, when I was in middle school, I got to shadow a judge for a day, similar to what y'all are doing with with Boost and meeting people that have different careers. And I realized, oh, no, this isn't what I want to do. <laughs> That's great. That's funny. I wanted to be a lawyer, but then I realized how long you have to go to school for that, and it wasn't with that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely okay to not know what you want to do at <laughs> your age, or even for me, I went to I, I wanted to be a civil engineer. I didn't know anything about industrial engineering when I went to AT, and then after my first year, um, I realized it wasn't just about building bridges and building, <laughs> designing buildings. So. I found something that was more up my alley. Right. Well, see, when you say engineer, John, I start thinking the kids who play with Legos, you know, like, like that's the thing, but not necessarily, yeah. right? And engineer is just definitely more than that now, especially with industrial engineers, we're more the people engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we connect that engineering aspect and process aspect, but we get to work a lot with people. Mm -hmm. And because process is, is important, but people are more important. And that's what we deal with. People drive processes so be able to work with the people um mm -hmm. has been great so we're definitely more social engineers uh <laughs> than other people that's right yeah someone in my um breakout room asked this awesome question about like who else are you working with to solve these problems is it just you guys or um and that's a great question i think probably one of the coolest parts about our team is that we work with people all over the hospital we work with doctors and nurses and people that are checking patients in and um, people that are, you know, making the technology, like the IT group. Um, so there's people that are coming at it from all different perspectives. And it's that diverse team with the different backgrounds and experiences that make for the best problem solving. So we help them connect all the dots, but we're getting our information from all different groups. Um, so that's an awesome question and, and something I think that um, makes the job so fun and so interesting and diverse. And I'm so inspired by all the people at the hospital doing what they do and we can make their jobs better and help patients. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's, I mean, thanks so much for sharing your uh, experiences and your lives and uh, your, you know, your professional work. And I was talking with Salam a little bit more about kind of sometimes you stumble into your career and then, you know, all of you are young enough and have not so many crow's feet where, you know, you can have a second and third career. I also, as a young person, always thought, well, you become a teacher and then you're a teacher until you're old and crotchety. And that's not necessarily true. You can, you can have a career, do it for 10 or 15 years and then jump to another one and be relatively young in that career too. So yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. Each of us have very different roles, even though we're all systems engineers, y'all work at Duke. You know, we each kind of work with different teams in the hospital. So I work with the digital strategy office. And essentially what that is, it's it's the team that creates all of the technology that you use as a patient. So, for example, whenever you um, during the pandemic, when we couldn't go in to see our doctors, a lot of people were doing video visits with their doctors just like this over Zoom. And that didn't really exist before COVID. So we help create a telehealth program, which basically means just having doctor's appointments um, on your phone, on your laptop with your doctor. Um, so that's one thing that my team does and we do all, all of the behind the scenes workflow and, and um, technology for that. Another thing we do, um, some of you might have this on your phones and it's a way to kind of track your steps or 
um, track your heart rate, or there's other ways you can track your biometrics or um, things that are you know going on in, in your body. And we can actually send that data to your doctor so your doctor can be tracking you when they're not actually with you. So this is um, something that is really useful when it comes to diabetes or hypertension, which just means you have a high, high blood pressure. So we create programs so that patients that need to be tracked more regularly can be tracked by their doctors. Um, and then finally, I just have these little pictures here of an iPhone and a little chat bot, something we just launched actually, if you go into the app store, it's the new My Duke Health app. It's brand new and this is a patient app that connects you to your doctors and you can ask the chat bot questions. And this is something we're super excited about. And it's just to make for, again, a better patient experience, um, easier time to connect with your doctor. And um, we want it to feel accessible, not something that's so complicated and confusing um, where you're calling and waiting forever. We want it to be right at your fingertips. So that's the team that I work on. Sorry, I forgot to take myself off mute. Um, so uh, so my, I really like my role because um, a lot of the work that I do is around making sure that we give the right care to the right patient at the right time. And that's what improving quality in a health system uh, revolves around a lot. And so these up, up there in the top left are four examples of programs that hospitals all over the country and the world provide data to. Uh, and those programs will actually assign rankings or ratings um, that a lot of patients and uh, people use the whole health system accountable to make sure that we are prioritizing the right things and providing quality care. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is around tracking data and working with leaders in our health system to make sure, um, based on our data, that they're that they're doing that and that we can improve in our quality. Uh, so a lot of that will use project management, which I put a little screen capture of just a, a project that I worked on. And, and that's a tool called a Gantt chart. And that's something that you can use to um, make sure that you're staying on track with your project timelines and that everyone knows what their responsibilities are. Um, it's a really cool tool that people often use in, in project management. And so that's just an example of something that I might be working on uh, to help make sure that we're improving our quality. Oh, sorry. So I actually, um, I actually support pal the palliative care team at Duke. Um, so palliative care is um, specialized medical care for people living with serious illnesses. And so this type of care is really focused on providing relief for patients. And the main goal is to improve the um, quality of life for both the patients and their families. Um, so a really important part of palliative care is something called advanced care planning, which is what this little, um, this little chart is. So advanced care planning is the process of planning for future medical care in the event that the patient in, uh, is unable to make their own decisions. Um, so this process really helps identify the patient's personal values and goals um, for their health and their own medical treatment. So during this time, they also determine um, who would like to make that, uh, who they would like to make their healthcare decisions on their behalf in case they can't make the decisions for themselves. Um, so in my specific role, I track the amount of these advanced care planning conversations and work to think about how we can increase um, these conversations throughout the health system. Okay, uh, so my role is a clinical service unit uh, management engineer. And all that means is basically I am a support engineer for two different service units in the hospital. Uh, one is oncology, cancer, and the other one is oncology, uh, which is heart, basically. Um, so what I am, I love my job because I not only get to work with the repeats of each of the service units, uh, who drive change, but I also get to work with doctors, the nurses, everyone within the team. Uh, so when you go to the hospital, if you know someone who has cancer, that has gone to Duke. I help uh, drive processes. Uh, I am a, what we call it, uh, a certain industrial engineers, uh, change, agents of change. Uh, and we drive change management within the hospital, uh, working on different process improvement projects, uh, different future uh, improvements and growth and everything you can see in these words and also continue with that continuous improvement, uh, make sure the, the process is efficiency, efficient. So 
um, making sure that wait times are down, um, making sure that everything is safe and set up and um, this doing the best for the teams and also the patients. That's all we got for you guys, but if you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat or ask us. And also we're always available um, if you wanna reach out to us over email or um, I think that Amber and Alexandra have that information. We would be happy to talk talk with you guys about how we got here. And um, if you have any, any interest in learning more, we would love to help. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You can see you're giving some, you're getting some thanks in the chat there. And there were some questions, definitely. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to say scholars, please ask those coaches, your coaches, those questions, and we can get them to John and Kelly and Salam and Fletcher uh, with no problem whatsoever. Um, and uh, again, you never know, like for some of you, this might be the time where you're meeting your future mentor. Like you don't know, like maybe you uh, you really like Salam's presentation and you reach out with a question and y'all have a dialogue and you just never know what that person can, the doors that person can open up for you. So just remember these names and faces folks because we're starting networking today, okay? Thanks so much professional services. We really appreciate y'all. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks so much for thank having you. us. It was, it was a blast. Great, yes. great. Well, thank we'll you definitely so much. do it again. Bye everyone. Have a good one.